Hey YouTube, welcome to this video on Ansible. I'm really excited to have you guys here and I hope you learn a lot from this video. Before we get started, let's have a look at what we'll be covering in this video. First of all, we'll be having a look at some prerequisites to learning Ansible. Next, we'll have a look at what Ansible actually is. Then, we'll be having a look at how Ansible actually works under the hood. After that, we'll learn a little about YAML files and how Ansible uses them to receive instructions from the user. We'll also be setting up an Ansible environment using AWS, so we can practice the commands that we've learned in the video, as well as test everything we've learned at the end of this video with a practical project. So without further ado, let's get started. Let's first have a look at all of the prerequisites you need to know to get the full potential out of this course. First, we have the basics of AWS. You need to be familiar with all of the most popular tools in AWS, like EC2, S3, and Redshift. You also need to be familiar with the basics of networking and IOs as well. Next up, we have the basics of Linux. You need to be familiar with some basic Linux terminology and commands. Some of these include CD, sudo, and nano. You also need to be familiar in general with how Linux works so you don't get confused during the tutorial. Finally, we have programming experience. It's highly recommended that you have worked with some other DevOps tools before following along with this video. This is because Ansible is a complex software and is not really intended for beginners. I personally recommend having used at least Docker and Kubernetes before following along with this video. But if you are confident enough in your DevOps skills, feel free to continue watching. Now that we've covered the prerequisites required to follow along with this video, let's dive straight into the basics of Ansible and what it actually is. So what is Ansible? Well, from the creators themselves, Ansible is an open source software provisioning, configuration management, and application deployment tool enabling infrastructure as code. It runs on many Unix-like systems and can configure both Unix-like systems as well as Microsoft Windows. So basically, Ansible is a software that can be used to automate boring IT tasks. This can include software provisioning to the public, configuring and managing multiple servers, and deploying new applications into the infrastructure when necessary. The great thing about Ansible is that it isn't just limited to just Windows. Ansible can run on any Unix-based system as well as Windows. This means that it can run on macOS as well, although I'm pretty sure most people don't have any macOS servers lying around. To automate tasks using Ansible, you need to use something called an Ansible playbook. Ansible playbooks are scripts written in the YAML format. You can do virtually anything using Ansible playbooks, which is why they're such a powerful tool. If you didn't know what the YAML format is, you'll have a refresher later on in this video. Ansible is owned by a company called Red Hat, an immensely popular software company that provides open source software to organizations. The great thing about Red Hat is that all of their software is completely open source, meaning that anyone and everyone can collaborate on their products. Finally, let's talk about pricing. Almost all of Red Hat's products are divided into two categories, the open source version and the commercial version. This applies to Ansible as well. The open source version is called the Ansible Engine, and the commercial version is called the Ansible Tower. You can download the Ansible engine directly from their GitHub URL, as it is completely free. As for Ansible Tower, there are a total of two pricing options. The first costs 13,000 US dollars a year, and the second costs 17,500 US dollars a year. The first option gives you support for a maximum of 100 nodes and 8x5 support, meaning 8 hours, 5 days a week. Nodes refer to the maximum number of servers you can use Ansible with. In this case, the maximum limit is 100 servers, and the second option gives you support for a maximum of 100 nodes as well, but offers 24-7 support. So if you're running very critical infrastructure and you need help immediately if something goes wrong, I suggest you go with the second option. The main difference between Ansible Engine and Ansible Tower is that while Ansible Engine is just the plain Ansible Engine, Ansible Tower has extra features that you can use for debugging, monitoring, and more. Now that you've got a general overview of what Ansible is, let's have a look at how Ansible works under the hood. Ansible's infrastructure is divided into seven main parts under the hood. Let's start from the first one. First, we have the Ansible Playbook. 
This is the automation script that we make using the YAML format, which we'll be discussing in greater detail later on. Next, we have the users. The users are the system administrators that are responsible for configuring and managing the Ansible environment as a whole. They are the ones that are responsible for creating the Ansible playbook as well. Then, we have the public and private clouds. If you have a cloud system in your infrastructure as well, you can add that into your Ansible infrastructure. It can also be commanded with any Ansible playbook that you give it. After that, we have the CMDB. The CMDB is responsible for keeping track of the relationship between IT infrastructure and their individual configurations. This is so Ansible can confirm whether a node has access to or is able to communicate with the node that it needs to. We also have the host and the networking on the right. The hosts are all of the nodes other than the cloud servers that are part of the Ansible infrastructure, while the networking consists of all the different paths that it can travel through inside the infrastructure. These are the same paths that Ansible uses to reach its destination node as well. The final four consist of parts that are located inside the Ansible automation engine itself. The first one is the inventory, which locally stores the IP addresses of all of the nodes in its network so that it can send the Ansible playbook over to them to be executed. The second one is the API, which is responsible for sending the Ansible playbook to all the required nodes and making sure that they execute properly. The third one are the modules, which are reusable standalone scripts that Ansible can use whenever it needs to. The scripts are sent to each node through the API and are then executed on the target node. The fourth and final one are the plugins, which are pre-prepared scripts that can be used to enhance your Ansible infrastructure and save you a lot of time in the process. These plugins don't cost you anything extra and can save you many hours if you know how to use them properly. Now that we've discussed a little about all of these parts in the Ansible infrastructure, Let's have a look at how all of these parts work together. Let's first start with the users. The users are responsible for creating the Ansible playbook and feeding them into the Ansible engine. If the user wishes to keep this playbook so that it can be reused in the future, it is saved as a module inside the Ansible engine. Regardless of whether the user decides to do this or not, the Ansible engine then has a look at the CMDB to check the user's permissions and also his relations. Now that we've discussed a little about all of the parts in the Ansible infrastructure, let's have a look at how all of these parts work together. Let's first start with the users. The users are responsible for creating the Ansible playbook and feeding them into the Ansible engine. If the user wishes to keep this playbook so that it can be reused in the future, it is saved as a module inside the Ansible engine. Regardless of whether the user decides to do this or not, the Ansible engine then has a look at the CMDB to check the user's permissions and also his relationship with the target node. If everything makes sense, then when the time to execute the playbook arrives, the Ansible engine has a look at the inventory to find the target node's IP address. With the help of the API, it sends the playbook using the networking infrastructure in place over to the target node, which is then executed. Using the same method, Ansible playbooks can also be sent to any connected cloud infrastructure to be run there as well. Finally, you also have the optional ability to use plugins, which allow you to reuse existing Ansible playbooks and save you a lot of time. Now that you know how Ansible works under the hood, let's dive straight into learning how Ansible playbooks are created using the YAML format. So as we discussed previously, Ansible playbooks are constructed using the YAML format. Now, what is the YAML format, you may ask? Well, YAML is a human-readable way to write configuration files. It can also be used to create files similar to XML, where data can also be stored or transmitted. In Ansible, the YAML used inside Ansible playbooks acts like a configuration file, specifying each and every task that needs to be performed. Ansible playbooks begin by writing three dashes at the top of the file. This indicates the start of the Ansible playbook and that everything below it should be checked. Ansible playbooks are divided into sections called plays. All plays are divided into three main parts. The first one is the name of the play itself. You can name it whatever you want, but just make sure that you do not include any spaces. 
If you examine this line closely, you will also notice that it's made up of two parts, a key and a value separated by a colon. The key here is the word name, while the value is the word play one. This is pretty much how YAML is structured, except in some scenarios, sections may also be used to separate parts of the file from other ones. The second one is the host to run the commands on. It might seem a bit odd that instead of specifying an IP address, the name web server is used instead. This is because inside Ansible engine inventory, all of the IP addresses are split into categories. Another name for the inventory, by the way, is the host file. Each category can contain multiple IP addresses, in which case specifying the category will run the commands on all of the IP addresses present in that category. This is extremely useful if you want to run the same commands on multiple nodes at once. The final one is the task section. This section contains the actual commands that will be executed on the target node. In YAML files, sections look like this, where you specify the, the name of the section followed by a colon. Everything under a section is indented, which tells the YAML file that it's part of a section. In this case, looking inside play1, you will see that the task section contains two key-value pairs and two subsections. And yes, it's possible to create subsections inside YAML files as well. The first key-value pair is specifying the name of the task that needs to be run on the target node. In this case, it's called install Apache, which is quite self-explanatory. Then we have our first subsection called yum. This refers to the yum keyword in CentOS, which is a distribution of Linux. YUM is the default package manager in CentOS, which is used to install applications using the terminal directly. What we're doing here is basically running a YUM command to install Apache on our target node. The YUM section has two key value pairs as well. The first one is the key name followed by the value Apache, and the second one is the key state followed by the value present. The first key value pair is responsible for specifying the name of the software you want to install. In this case, the name of the software is Apache. The second key value pair is responsible for specifying the way in which the software should be installed. The first option is present and the second option is latest. The present option installs the current version of the software. For example, the current version of Node.js is 14.17.3 at the time of saying this. So specifying this option will install Node.js version 14.17.3. You can also replace the word present with the word installed, as both mean the same thing to Ansible. As for the latest option, it installs the most leading edge version of the software available. In the case of Node.js, currently that's version 16.5.0 at the time of saying this. So as you can see, I'm currently on my AWS management console. So let's get started with our practical project. So first of all, I'm going to go to the search bar and search for EC2. And over here, you can see the first result, which is EC2 virtual servers in the cloud. So I'm going to click on that. Next, we have our resources. So over here, I'm going to click on the instances running link over here. So as you can see, I currently have zero running instances. So now we're, what we're going to be doing is creating two EC2 instances. One of them is going to be our master and the other is going to be our slave. So we're going to be installing Ansible on our master and we're going to be using the master to communicate with the slave. So let's get started. Now, first of all, I'm going to click on the launch instances button over here and I'm going to scroll down and select Ubuntu Server 20.04 SDN. Then I'm going to choose my instance type. So over here, I have multiple options. And by default, it selects the one that is eligible with the AWS free tier, meaning that it won't actually cost me anything. So this is one virtual CPU and one gigabyte of memory. So I'm going to click on next. And then I can configure the number of instances that I want to create. So in this field, I'm going to enter two because I want to create two EC2 instances so I'm going to click on next after that. And over here, I can configure storage. We're going to leave it as it is. So eight gigabytes is the default amount of storage that you get in an EC2 instance. So I'm going to click on next. Then we have our tags. I'm going to skip over those. And then we have configure security growth. So over here, 
we are basically creating the security group for our EC2 instances. So in this case, the default name is launch wizard one, as you can see over here. And this one increments if you have multiple EC2 instances. So it can be launch wizard one, two, three, etc. So so I'm gonna select it as it is, and you can see that SSH is enabled for our EC2 instances. So I'm gonna click on review and launch. And then over here you can see review instance launch. So all of our settings are configured correctly. So then I'm gonna click on the launch button. So over here, it gives me a few options. So either I can choose an existing key pair, proceed without a key pair, or create a new key pair. Now a key pair is basically a public key and a private key, and together they allow you to connect to your instances securely. So it's so hackers can't hack into your system, basically, if you have a public IP address. So in this case, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be creating a new key pair, because as you can see, I currently don't have any key pairs. And I'm going to create a key pair called Ansible. And then we're going to click on this button over here, download key pair. And as you can see, it starts the download. And now I have an ansible.pdm file inside my folder. So now that that's downloaded, let's click on the launch instances button. And as you can see, it's currently creating the AWS instances. So I'm going to click on the view instances button and over here you can see that the two instances are being created so ignore these two at the top these are previous ones that are used so the ones that currently don't have any labels you can see that these are currently blank are the ones that we just created right now and what we can do is we can actually go into filter instances and we can search running and then it'll only show those instances which are currently running so if I refresh this, then you can see that both of our instances, the ones that we just created, are currently running over here. So now let's give them some names. So I'm going to give the first one a name of master. And I'm going to give the second one a name of slave. All right, so now that that's done, let's actually SSH into our instances so we can get started with some Ansible related work. So first of all, I'm going to click on the instance ID of the master node. And over here, it gives me a public IPv4 address. So now I'm going to open my PuTTY tool. So PuTTY is a very, very useful tool for SSHing into any instances that you want to. And you can install this if you go to PuTTY.org. So there is a website called PuTTY.org where you can download PuTTY from. So in this case, Putty, I'm currently using it on Windows. Another Linux alternative is OpenSSH. And there's actually a pretty significant, uh, significant difference between the two, which we'll see right now. So let me copy this IP address. Keep in mind that this is currently our master node. You can see 87EC at the end. So this is currently our master node. And now what I'm going to do is open Putty and paste this link over here. I, I mean the IP address over here. And then on the left, you can see that we have some drop downs and some windows. I'm going to click on the SSH drop down and I'm going to select auth over here. And then I'm going to click on the browse button and I'm going to go to the same folder where I downloaded the file. And I'm going to click on this, all files, and I'm going to select the ansible.pem file. So this is the authentication file that we're going to be using. And then I'm going to click on the open button. So over here, I'm going to click on accept. And what does it say over here? unable to use key file as this is a PEM format. So basically the problem here is that PuTTY does not work using PEM files. And to use PEM files, you need to use OpenSSH. But because we're using PuTTY, we can't really use a PEM format. So the solution to this is to use another format called a PPK format. So you can see that even if I log in, so the default username is it says no supported authentication methods available and server sent public key. So this basically means that you cannot connect using a public key and you need a private key or a PPK file instead. So to convert a PEM file into a PPK file, you can use the PuTTY gen tool, which is installed with PuTTY by default. So I'm going to click on the load button over here and I'm going to go to my folder and all files and I'm going to select ansible.pem and now I'm going to click on the CPE button and then I'm going to click on yes and now you can see that it says as a PPK file and I can give it the same name ansible and click on save 
So now this is done. So now what we're going to be doing is going back to Putty and pasting the same IP address, going to SSH, auth, and then clicking on browse. And this time I'm going to be selecting the PPK file, clicking on enter, and then the open button over here. So as you can see, it is currently logging in to the master node. So log in as Ubuntu and authenticating with public key imported open SSH key. So now it has successfully logged in into my master node. So now I'm going to log in into my slave node. And to do that, I can just right click and open a new putty window. And I'm going to go to my slave, copy the public IPv4 address of my slave. And then I can paste that over here, go to SSH auth browse and because we created both of the ec2 instances using the same key value pairs we can use the same ppk file to log in into our slave node as well so i'm going to click on open there and then click on open over here and now we have our worker node over here so i'm going to log in as ubuntu and now you can see that it is logged in over here as well same thing authenticating with public key imported open ssh key so now I'm going to bring up the other putty window. So here's the master and here's the slave. So I'm going to put the master on the left. I'm going to put the slave on the right over here. So now we have them organized. So now let's get started with some actual Ansible work. So before that, we have some prerequisites. So first of all, we need to run some commands on the master node. So the first one is sudo add, sudo apt add repository. And then over here, it's going to be ppa colon ansible slash ansible. So this is basically adding a ansible repository to our node. So I'm going to click on enter. And now it's going to activate the ansible archive so that we can access it from our node over here. So as you can see, it's almost done. So as you can see, we have just added the ansible repository. Now we need to update our system. So that's going to be sudo apt update. And now our system is updated. And now what we're going to be doing is running sudo apt install ansible. So if we didn't run the first command, which was the repository one, then we wouldn't have access to this command called sudo apt install ansible because you need to add this repository separately. So because we added the repository, we can now install ansible using the sudo apt install command. So as you can see, it's 97% done. So let's just wait for this to be done. And as you can see, the installation has now been completed. So that was our setup on the master node. Now we have some setup steps on the slave node as well. So first of all, we have sudo apt update. And then the next command is, let me just clear the screen, sudo apt get install python 3. And as you can see, python 3 is already installed on our slave node by default. So now that we've made sure that everything is set up, let's do a little test to see the connection between our master node and our slave node just by SSHing normally. Now, since Ansible uses SSH technology, it should technically work in the same way, right? So let's have a look at how this works. So first of all, I'm going to enter the SSH command. So SSH and the user for our slave is Ubuntu. So SSH Ubuntu at and then the IP address, so 172.31.26.154. So I'm going to SSH, I'm going to write yes, and over here it says permission denied public key. So this is actually an issue that occurs whenever you want to sync up two instances to be able to SSH between them. And what you need to do to solve this issue is basically create or generate an authorized key so that the master node has permission to contact the slave node. So to do this, we're going to go into the SSH folder. So all instances, all Linux machines have a .SSH folder, which you can access from the root. So you can see I'm currently on the root. We have the tilde over here by typing CD space .SSH. So this is a special folder called .SSH, which isn't visible normally 
if you just do a normal ls. So if I do an ls, you can't see the folder over here, but if I enter cd.ssh, then it is accessible. This is because this is a private root folder, so it's basically a very sensitive folder, and if you screw something up over here, then it can have really big consequences. So that's why Linux secures it. But anyways, now that we're in the folder, let's have a look at the ls, and you can see that we have two files over here. Now let's do the same thing over here, so cd ssh on our worker node, and then ls, and over here we only have a authorized keys file. So now what we're going to be doing is we are basically going to be creating uh, or using the ssh keygen command on the master node to create a specific key that we can add to the authorized keys of our worker node so that our master node gets permission to connect to our slave or worker node. So I hope that isn't too complicated. We'll see it as we go on. So let's use the ssh keygen command. So ssh keygen on the master node inside the same folder so everything remains organized and it isn't too complicated. So now over here, enter file in which to save the key. I want to do the same file. So I'm just going to click on enter, then enter the passphrase. I'm going to keep it as empty, so enter, and enter the same passphrase again. It's empty, so enter. And now my key has been created. So now I'm going to clear the screen and do another ls and as you can see we have two new files idrsa and idrsa.pub so i'm going to use the cat command so sudo cat idrsa.pub and as you can see here is the code that we're going to be pasting into our slave node so that our master node can contact the slave node so i'm going to copy it over here copy that and then I'm going to go to my slave node and I'm going to open the authorized keys file. So sudo nano authorized keys. And over here you can see we already have one key. So we can just go to the next line and we can paste it over here. And then control S, control X, so exit. And I'm going to clear the screen on both sides. Now I'm going to run the same SSH command again. So I'm just going to go back to my home over here. And SSH Ubuntu at 172.31.26.154. So as you can see, it has SSH successfully. So you can see that our IP address after SSHing is 26154 at the end. And you can see that our slave node is also 26154 at the end. And if I exit from the SSH, we can see that we now reverted to the same IP address of our actual master node, which is uh, at the last five digits are 18255 instead of 26154. So now let's clear the screen over here as well. And now let's get started with actually running some Ansible playbooks. So over here, I have some Ansible playbooks ready. So this is our first Ansible playbook. And let's start from the top. So first of all, we have the three dashes. And these three dashes basically define the start of our Ansible file. Then we have this field over here. So we have our name, or well, the key, which is called name, separated by the value, which is day one. And keys and values can be written like this without this dash over here. But if they're written in a dash, that means that they can be structured inside a list format, meaning that you can put multiple values which have this dash right beneath each other without indenting. So that's pretty cool. Although this one over here does not have any uh, dashes over here. So you can't do that with this specific key value pair. So over here, we have a key value pair name. So the key is name and the value is play one. So this basically refers to the, the, the Ansible playbook itself. So this Ansible playbook is called play one. So this is our first playbook. And then we have hosts. So host refers to the, the host that we're basically targeting with our command. So in this case, I'm targeting web server. So we're going to have a look at what this is in a moment, but let's just say that this is a random IP address. Then we have the task section. So over here, we can define our actual tasks. And then inside the indentation, we have another name key value pair. So in this case, the key is name, and then the value can be anything. It can be capitalized. It can have spaces, whatever you want. Basically, it's like a description. So in this case, I'll just, I just called it install Node.js. So obviously, by the name, you can tell that we're going to be using Ansible to install Node.js remotely onto our slave. And then we have another key value pair, become yes. 
And the reason we use this over here is because to install any software or almost any software, including Node.js, you need to have at least temporary root privileges. So to do this, you can just use become yes. So it will add sudo to the beginning of whatever command that you're running. And then we have our apt command. So this is how it's structured. We have our apt section. And then inside we have the name of the software. And in this case, it's Node.js. So it has to be exactly how it's written on the terminal. So this is how it's written, Node.js. And then we have state. Now the state can either be present or it can be latent. So present basically refers to the LTS version. So whatever the LTS version of Node.js is, is gonna be installing that one. And if we replace that with latest, it's gonna be installing the bleeding edge version of Node.js instead, whatever that may be. And same goes for any other softwares that you may install. So that's basically what the state and present key value pairs do. So now that we know what this Ansible playbook actually does, let me just resave this and copy the code, minimize this. And now I'm gonna basically create this on my master node. So sudo nano play1.yaml and I'm gonna paste everything over here and I'm gonna click on control S, control X. And now we have our first YAML file saved over here. So now what you're gonna be doing is using the Ansible playbook command to actually run our Ansible playbook. So ansible hyphen playbook, and now we're gonna be adding another uh, flag at the end of this, so ansible playbook, play1.yaml. Instead of just executing it like this over here, we're gonna add another flag, which is dash dash syntax dash check. So this is gonna be checking the syntax of our ansible playbook. So over here, you can see there's a, a few warnings over here, so you can just ignore those temporarily. And over here, you can see that we don't have any other errors. So if there are any syntax errors, then they come in red. So we're gonna be fixing these warnings right now. So now what are these warnings exactly? So now that we know that our playbook is fine, what are these warnings about? So provided host list is empty, only localhost is available. Note that the implicit localhost does not match all. And the second warning says, could not match supplied host pattern, ignoring web server. So let's have a look at our Ansible playbook once more. So that's sudo nano play one dot yaml. And over here you can see that our host is called web server. So what you're gonna be doing is CDing basically. So we're gonna be CDing into the Ansible folder. So that's CD slash etc slash Ansible. So you're gonna start from the root and then we're gonna, gonna go to the uh, etc folder and then the Ansible folder. And now if I do the ls over here, you can see we have two files, ansible.cfg and host. So we're not gonna go to the ansible.cfg file. I'll just show you what it is though. So this is basically the configuration file for Ansible and you can configure a lot of stuff over here if you need to. So you can see that this is a very, very long file and it basically contains tons of stuff that you can edit inside Ansible to make your experience more smoother or do any custom stuff if you want to. So I'm just gonna remove this for now. And we also have the second file, which is the host file, which is what you're gonna be editing right now. So that's gonna be sudo nano hosts. And over here we have a file called hosts. So now what you're gonna be doing is defining a section. So you can see an example over here. So I'm just gonna go to the top. You can see that we have this thing over here. So it's commented out these five lines. But what these five lines actually do, I'm gonna be explaining right now. So first of all, in the top line, we have two square brackets and then inside the square brackets we have web servers. So this is basically how you define a section. So a section can contain multiple IP addresses, multiple domains, multiple hosts, I guess. And when you define this name inside a YAML file, so for example, I inside the host section, I just write web servers, it'll send that Ansible playbook to all of the IP addresses or domains under that section. So in this case, it's gonna be sending that command to all four of these domains or IP addresses. And if there's only one, it sends it to one. If there's two, it sends it to two, etc. So instead of using the section, we can also specify the IP address directly. So you can just write the IP address down normally, and then you can just type that same IP address inside the file and it'll work perfectly. But the reason this is not a good idea, this isn't a very good, uh, a good best practice, and the reason this is so is because it's actually very unsafe to keep your public IP address inside your YAML file. Because if someone gets access to it, then they immediately know your IP address or the IP address of your host and they can easily target it, which is pretty unsafe. 
So to combat this issue, you can basically just write the name of, of a section. So for example, web server or web servers and give multiple names under that specific section. And then it'll just contact all of those sections directly and you just have to specify the name. So that's pretty easy to handle and much more secure. So let's do the same thing and inside the yaml file we created a section or what we specified in the host field was web server like this and then we're going to be entering the ip address so in this case it's the slave over here uh, so 172 that's going to be 172.31.26.154 and then we're going to save the file and i'm going to exit and now it has been saved so now I'm going to go back to my root folder, so cd tilde, and now I'm going to be running my Ansible playbook. So Ansible playbook play1.yaml. And just to show you that Node.js isn't actually installed on the worker node, I can type the Node.js command over here, and you can see command Node.js not found, but can be installed with this command over here, which is what we're going to be running through the YAML file, except we're going to be running this remote so this command is basically going to be run remotely through the ansible playbook so now let's execute the command and you can see this is basically how the output looks like so first of all we have the play so this specifies the name of the play so it's called play one then we have the task so over here basically looks at the ip address and confirms whether it's a valid ip address or not so in this case it says okay meaning that this is in fact a valid ip address and it recognizes it and you can see that there aren't any errors either so currently it is installing node.js so this will take some time so as you can see we now have an output that says change so this basically refers to change ip address and the ip address is 172.31.26.154 and then over here we have a recap of basically everything that happened so over here let me just full screen this we have the ip address uh, and this is highlighted in yellow to refer to the fact that this was in fact changed uh, so this is basically the ip address that we contacted or the node that we actually changed something on that's what this refers to it's not referring to the fact that the actual ip address changed that didn't happen it's referring to the fact that something on this specific ip address on the node on the specific ip address has changed so that's basically how it works and then over here we have an OK field, so OK equals 2. So we did two things basically. Number one, installing Node.js, and number two, actually looking for the IP. So both of those were successful. Then also we have an unreachable error. So if we didn't specify that SSH thing over there, then it would have actually given us a unreachable output. So this would be 1, and it would be uh, color-coded in red. And then it will also be failed, so this is also red. And then we also have skipped. So if something is found unnecessary by Ansible, then it's just directly skipped to save time. Or if it's cached, for example, either way, it's just skipped. Then we have rescued. So in the case that there is any uh, critical issue that Ansible can rescue, it rescues it. And in that case, uh, it actually uh, it shows up over there. So for example, if it prevents a kernel panic or something like that, then it'll probably show up over there. And then we have ignored. So let's say you have any comments or whatever inside your Ansible file, then those will just be ignored. Or any commands that Ansible itself decides to ignore for any appropriate reason, it'll just straight up ignore it. So now we have run our Ansible playbook. And now to see that it's actually working, to prove that it's actually working, let me type Node.js on the worker node. And you can see instead of giving me this output, it actually entered the Node.js subterminal. So I'm just going to control C out of this, but you can see that Node.js has now been successfully installed on our saved node. So now that we're done with the first Ansible playbook, let's move on to the second one. So first of all, let me show you that I just removed my worker instance. So you can see currently over here, I only have my master instance active. And if I click on master over here in my instances tab, you can see that the private IP address is 172.31.18.255, which is the case over here as well, as you can see. So the reason I removed my slave instance is because for the rest of the two playbooks, we don't really need these uh, the second slave. So the reason for that is because all of these commands are going to be executed on something called localhost. So let's have a look at that. So first of all, let me bring up the YAML file itself. So you can see that this is our second playbook. 
So first of all, it starts with the three dashes at the top over here. Then we have the main key register, and you can see that the value is play2, indicating that this is in fact the second playbook. Then we have the host's key register over here. So over here, the value is localhost, and we'll just get to that in a minute, so what localhost actually is. Then we have the task section, so inside this we are defining all of our tasks. So you can see that the name of the task is create S3 bucket, and then we have our S3 bucket section, and then we have tons of different key registers over here. So let's have a look at these. Now, first of all, we are defining the name of the S3 bucket that we want to create. So in this case, it's going to be called my Ansible bucket 3. And then we have the AWS access key and AWS secret key. So these are very, very important tools. And if you have worked with AWS a little, then you will know that these are basically special keys that you can use to perform any administrative activities on your account. So let's say I want to create something or delete something or edit something. I'm going to need root privileges or temporary root privileges. And you can get those privileges by copy pasting these access and secret keys. And then you'll be allowed to do pretty much whatever you want on AWS. But it's important to note that these are very private keys and that they're not to be given out to your random developer or whatever. These should, be, uh, these should stay safe with only you, the owner, and nobody else. And if the developer wants to use it, then he should only have, he or she should only have permission to use the access key and not the secret key. So just a little tip for you guys. But in the case of Ansible playbooks, we do need to specify both of them as this specific command is going to be creating something, meaning that you need root privileges. So you need permission, which you can get by adding the secret key. So then we move on to the state. So just like we had state latest and state present in the last playbook, over here we've defined it as state present and we also have the region over here in this case it's us west 2 and if we go back over here you can see us west 2 is referring to uh, us west oregon so there's that then we have versioning so in this case we've kept it as disabled because we don't really need versioning for this example it's kind of unnecessary right now and then we have our tag section and inside our tag section we actually have two sub key value pairs first of all we have the name and then we have the type so when you create a key value pair for pretty much any service inside AWS, you have to specify a key and a value. And the key is called a type and the value is called, uh, the key is called the name and the value is called a type. So same thing over here. In this field, we're defining the key, which is Ansible. And in this field, we're defining the value, which is S3 bucket. And combining them together, it makes up one single tag, Ansible, S3 bucket. So the key is Ansible and the value is S3 bucket. So that's basically the entirety of this playbook. So now let me just copy this over here and let's execute it on our marching node. Now what does localhost actually mean over here? Well, localhost is basically referring to the machine itself. So the reason that I actually chose out of my slave instance is because we're gonna be executing this specific playbook directly on our master node because it doesn't really have anything to do with our slave nodes or if we had any other nodes, it doesn't really have anything to do with those either. And what you're doing is basically just working with AWS. So you could technically just do that from your local host to your local machine. You don't really need to contact another machine to do this. It's just kind of useless. So we're just gonna be doing it from this machine itself. Same thing for the second playbook, which we're executing now, and the same for the next playbook as well. So now let's actually paste it over here and see if the syntax is correct. So you can see I currently only have one playbook, so sudo nano play2.yaml. I'm going to paste this yaml file over here, again with localhost, and I'm going to exit. And also another fun fact, localhost, you don't actually need to define it inside the uh, yaml files itself. Uh, I mean inside the Ansible configuration file or the host file. And the reason for that is because this is something that is just hardcoded into Ansible. You can remove it using the ansible.csv file, but it is enabled by default and you don't really need to define anything with the host file or, or uncomment anything or anything like that. So it's just enabled by default, ready for you to use as soon as you install Ansible, which is pretty great. So over here, let me just write syntax check. Let's check the syntax of this playbook. And you can see that everything is fine. And now let's actually execute the playbook. I'm just gonna remove this drag over here. And now let's execute it. So over here you can see that it has found localhost and it's creating the S3 bucket. And now what I'm gonna do is 
I'm going to search for S3 and open this in a new tab and click on this over here. And as you can see, we have my Ansible bucket 3. And you can see that it was created at this time over here. And you can see that's the exact time in my computer as well. So that is in fact the current time, meaning that this did in fact create using Ansible. And just to prove that to you guys, I'm gonna select this over here and I'm gonna delete the bucket. So type the name of the bucket, my Ansible bucket 3, delete the bucket. And now I'm just gonna refresh the page. So you can see that clearly we do not have any other buckets on this page right now. So now what we're gonna be doing is going back, clearing the screen, and we're gonna execute the same command once again. And you can see that it has now executed. And now I'm gonna be refreshing the page. And you can see that we now have the bucket over here. Again, this is the same time matching my computer time as well, meaning that this is in fact working perfectly. So now we have covered the second Ansible playbook. All right, so now that we're done with our second Ansible playbook, let's move on to the third and final one. So you can see over here that I have my master instance open. So now let's have a look at our Ansible playbook. So let's start from the top. So first of all, we have our three dashes. Then we have our name key value pair indicating the name of the file. So in this case, it's play three or playbook three. Then we have our hosts key value pair. So over here, we're defining the host in which the YAML file is gonna be executed on. In this case, it's localhost. Then we have our task section, and this is just all of the tasks that we're gonna be executing inside this YAML file. So the name of the task is provision EC2 instance using Ansible. And then we have our EC2 section over here. And then we have tons of different key value pairs over here, which we're gonna go through one by one. So first of all, we have the key value pair. So in this case, we're selecting the Ansible key value pair, the one that we created in the beginning. So we don't really need to update anything. I mean, upload anything. And the reason for that is because if we go over here to our instance, then over here, if I search for key pairs, over here, I have key pairs EC2 feature. So I can open this in, new, in a new tab and you can see over here that we have a key called Ansible meaning that the same PPK and PEM files that we created are stored directly inside AWS so we don't actually need to upload it ourselves to the EC2 instance, which is pretty damn cool. So now going back to the YAML file over here, next we have the instance type. So the instance type that we chose is t2.micro. So in this case, it is the Amazon free tier so that it doesn't charge me. If you have the Amazon free tier, then I highly recommend using this specific instance as we've been using it from the beginning of this course. Next, we have the image. So over here, we have the image ID. So if I click on the launch instances button over here, over here, if I scroll down, you can see that I have Ubuntu server 20.04 LTS. So over here, I have a specific code so AMI 03D5C68DAD01FP496, very long code, but you can copy this and paste it into your YAML file to indicate to AWS that you want to create an EC2 instance with this specific operating system. So you can see that's exactly what we did as well. And next we have the region. So inside the region, let me just click on this. So over here you can see that we're currently doing all of this on US West Oregon or US West 2. So we're gonna be selecting the same region over here as well. And then we have our group. So group basically relates to subnet group and we're gonna be touching on this in just a moment. Next we have the count. So this basically indicates how many EC2 instances you wanna create. So in this case, you just wanna create one. Then we have our VPC subnet ID. Again, we're just gonna touch on this in a little bit. Then we have the assigned public IP key value pair. So over here, we're just gonna keep this as yes, meaning that we want a public IP for our EC2 instance. Next, we have our AWS access key and secret key, and that basically concludes our YAML file over here. So now you can see that inside security group and inside VPC subnet ID, the fields are currently blank, meaning that we need to fill them in. So let me just minimize this and show you how you can create a subnet group and a VPC subnet to add to your YAML file. So first of all, I'm gonna be duplicating this tab. So I'm gonna make two duplicates. And in the first one, I'm gonna be searching for subnet group. So we're here, subnet group. 
and you can see we have an option over here that says if I search for uh, security group my bad security group over here we have security group ETC feature and you can see that I'm currently in my security groups and over here I'm gonna be searching for subnet and over here we have subnet UTC feature so I'm gonna click on that and now let's go to the first one so first of all we need to create a security group where our EC2 instances are gonna live and how they're gonna be secure so I'm gonna click on the button that says create security group and I'm gonna create a new security group and let's call it launch user 2 in this case launch user 2 and then in the description I'm gonna type allows SSH access to developers and then we have the VPC this is the default VPC that we're doing everything on so I'm just gonna select this one then we have the inbound rules we're gonna be configuring three inbound rules and three outbound rules just so that we don't have any complications later on so first of all we have our first inbound rule so this is gonna be all traffic so it's gonna allow all traffic to pass inbound and we're gonna give it a source of IPv4 so all IPv4 addresses can pass and then we also have another rule and over here we're gonna give it as IPv6 and then we have a third rule which is for SSH and this is by default on port number 22 using the TCP protocol and then in the source we're gonna be configuring anywhere IPv4 I'm not gonna bother adding IPv6 because I have a IPv4 computer and if you want to add it then sure you can but otherwise you can just leave it as it is and we're gonna be doing the same thing over here so you can see right now I just configured this for IPv4 all traffic second one all traffic and this is gonna be for IPv6 third one is gonna be SSH and then this is gonna be for IPv4 over here there we go so now that this is done I'm gonna click on the create security group button so it's creating the three inbound rules and three outbound rules and you can see that it has now been created so now what we want to do is we want to copy this name over here not the code because it isn't asking for our security group ID it's just asking for group meaning security group so we are just gonna copy the name not the ID so we're gonna copy this and then go over here and paste it over here in this in this key value pair now we're gonna save the file there we go next we have our VPC subnet ID so now that we're done with this first one let me just exit the page over here and now let's create a new subnet so you can see that we currently have four subnets over here so let's examine the ciders of these subnets you can see that the IPv4 addresses and ciders so first of all the ciders are all 20 and the IPv4 addresses are incrementing by 16 each time so over here we have 172.3, 1.0.0, then we have 0 0.16, 0 0.32, 0 0.48, and now we're going to be creating another subnet, and we're going to name it 0 0.64. So I'm going to click on create subnet, VPC ID, and then over here I'm going to give the subnet a name, I'm just going to call it EC2 subnet, and over here availability zone, over here I'm going to be selecting US West 2, A and 2B and 2C, the, all three you can select anyone which you prefer and the reason that I'm not selecting no preference is because if you select no preference there is a chance that it automatically selects US West 2D and the problem with 2D is that currently Ansible cannot work with any availability zones configured at US West 2D meaning that you need to select either 2A, 2B or 2C so I need to specify one specifically so in this case I'm just gonna be selecting US West 2A and then over here we have our same cider block so I'm just gonna give this a cider block of 172.31.64.0.20 over here just as I explained a minute ago and this is our final IPv4 cider block 172.31.64.0 is the IP address and then our cider is 20 so now let us scroll down and click on create subnet and the subnet is now being created and you can see that our subnet has now been created now because inside this YAML file it's asking for our VPC subnet ID we're gonna be pasting the ID and not the name the name is EC2 subnet but the ID is this over here so to copy this I can just do I'm gonna flip this over here and then copy this from here and that's all we really need so I'm gonna click on this paste that over here save the file 
and we're pretty much done with our Ansible playbook. So now I'm just going to close this window over here and this one. So now you can see over here, let me just close running. So over here you can see that we have two running instances and one terminated instance. So if I refresh the page, then that's exactly what it is. We have the master, we have the slave, and we have this random terminated instance over here. So now what we're going to be doing is going inside PuTTY and we're going to be basically pasting our third playbook. So sudo nano nano play v dot yaml and then over here you can see that I currently have a playbook over here. I'm just going to remove the contents or I can just delete it, delete it directly. So remove rf space v dot yaml and I'm going to create it once more so we can add the new configurations that we just created. So over here, I'm just going to copy this, control A, control C, and I'm going to paste it over here, control S, control X. And you can see that we currently have our three YAML files. So we have all of our three playbooks, and now we're going to be executing the final playbook, play yaml So now I'm going to do a syntax check if I don't forget to actually do the syntax check without actually running it by accident. Uh, syntax check, there we go. And as you can see, the syntax is perfect, no errors whatsoever. So I'm going to create the page, and now I'm going to be executing it. So Ansible Playbook, play 3 dot yaml And as you can see, it's currently being executed. And over here, you can see we have no errors. And now if I go over here, and if I refresh the page, you can see that we now have a new instance that is being created. So you can give this whatever name you want, and now that we are done with the whole master slave thing, I'm just going to exit from here, and now I'm going to be renaming this, let me rename this to something called um, Ansible EC2 instance over here, and now you can see that it is running as well, so I'm just going to refresh the page, and you can see that it's running. I'm going to click on the instance ID, I'm going to click on the public IPv4 address, and remember, it uses the same key value pair as our previous EC2 instances, which is Ansible, so we don't actually need to create a new key pair. So I'm going to go into PuTTY once more, and I'm going to paste this over here, I'm going to go to SSH, auth, browse, and I'm going to search for the EC2 file, the same one as before, and I'm going to click on open, and accept. Log in as Ubuntu, and as you can see, we have logged in successfully, and you can see that the private IDs over here, 172.31.68.205, matches the one in the terminal as well. So that concludes our video on Ansible. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!